I'm going to tell you why I think the 2023 Twins have a much higher floor than they did going into 2022 on today's episode of Locked On Twins. You are Locked On Twins. Your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And welcome to the Lockdown Minnesota Twins podcast. Today is Monday, January 30th, and I'm your gracious host, Nash Walker. Thanks for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every single day on the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Again, this is Nash Walker, four off-seasons, three seasons, hosting a daily podcast on the Minnesota Twins during the off-season until February 15th. So we got about two weeks. We have three days a week podcast, then we'll go back to five when pitchers and catchers report. Been doing this for a long time. I want to remind you, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Lockdown. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown today to get started. I'm going to tell you today why I think the Twins have a much higher floor going into the season, and maybe things will change in spring training, always possible, but I think they have a much higher floor in 2023 than they did entering the 2022 season want to tell you as well we have a really really fun guest lined up for Tuesday so the plan is Dick Bramer is going to come on the show Tuesday afternoon that episode should be posted Tuesday evening so I'm really excited to have Dick on to talk Correa 2023 his book so much with Dick uh, coming up Tuesday so join me for that should be a ton of fun first time he's been on the show and I will ask him as well about the depth on the roster because I believe The floor is a lot higher for the Twins in 2023. And in my season preview last year, like leading up until opening day, and I said it throughout the season, I've said it early in this offseason, my whole point with the 2022 Twins, I was excited. And I think people are excited. Like you see the podcast numbers, you see the readership, I see the interaction on Twitter. People are excited about the 2022 Twins, and rightly so. After they signed Correa, he was a seven-win player. In 2021, you know, Byron had an amazing 61 games. It was a shortened season for him, but it was amazing 61 games. They traded for Sonny Gray. You know, they got a little bit aggressive after the trade deadline, shook things up. New new looking team and lineup after they had won, you know, 73 games in 2021. So there was a lot of excitement around the team. And I think, again, rightly so, there was a lot of excitement around that team. I was excited. I wanted to see what, what was going to happen with that group because I was on the record saying, This team could win anywhere from 70 to 90 games. And the reason I set the floor at 70, so when I say I think they could win X to to Y amount of games, the floor setting personally has more to do with the pitching side and the ceiling has more to do with the offense. And I think I look at it that way because when your pitching crumbles, I feel your, your team crumbles more quickly but maybe that's just my perception and like availability bias of thinking about the twins. But when their pitching crumbled in 2021 and they had a lot of injuries on the position player side, it was this, this stew of nasty ball. And it happened again in September of 2022. I view the floor as being, I would say eight to 10 wins higher in 2023. And here's why I will never forget this. This is this is going to be one of my lasting memories of the 2022 season. There were some really fun memories. This is going to be one of my lasting memories, okay? I'm at Target Field, and I brought this up in recent weeks because with Pablo Lopez coming on board, it was, it was prominent in my mind. I was at Target Field. It was game two of a three-game series at home against Cleveland. But let's go back one day. So the Twins come back from New York, and I was sitting here after they beat the Yankees in the series finale, did an episode. Twins come back from New York. They have a three-game series with Cleveland at home. And this is hard to hard to remember. Like it's it's hard to put myself in this headspace. But on September 9th, they were a game and a half back of Cleveland with 26 to play. And a majority of those games are a large portion against Cleveland, like more than than usual of a portion. One and a half games back, coming home. You get a three-game series against the team you're trying to catch. Game and a half. You win two. You know, first two games, you're back in first place at home, right? Here are the probables in that series. Probable starting pitchers. Dylan Bundy versus Cal Quantrill on Friday. I think it was Friday. Chris Archer versus Tristan McKenzie in game two. And Josh Winder 
versus Shane Bieber in game three. Bundy, Archer, Winder versus Quantrill, McKenzie, Bieber. I mean, I I struggle to think about what that was like because in the moment, I just wanted so desperately for the Twins to win. And I was just, I was trying to almost convince myself that they had a chance and they did. You always have a chance. You know, it's baseball. Best teams in the world win six, six and a half games out of 10, right? But that's just like illustrates to me where the Twins are at. That's the pitching side. And some of that is how it lined up. Joe Ryan, Sonny Gray, they just didn't happen to pitch in that series. But I think that's a takeaway too. Like you got to make sure these guys pitch. And the problem when you have such a shallow rotation is you're going to you're gonna run into this problem. The Twins are in must-win games every day in September. You can't pitch Joe Ryan every day. You can't pitch Sonny Gray every day. Tyler Malley gets hurt. Like the Twins are in trouble because their rotation is so shallow. That's the point here. Even if the schedule didn't line up in the way they liked, it illustrates how shallow the rotation was going into that series, a must-win series. If not, you know, a, a series that you might have to sweep just to give yourself some confidence, get back into first place, back in the driver's seat. That's what we we're looking at. Bundy, Archer, Winder versus Quantrill, McKenzie, and Bieber. That, that blows my mind, and what blows my mind even more is the lineup the Twins trotted out on that night in Game 1, a game they lost 7-6. to six. Let's go over that lineup and why I think it's going to be different in 2023 after this word from FanDuel Sportsbook. It's that time, Super Bowl Sunday. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Lockdown because they're the number one sportsbook in America, that's FanDuel. And if you've never, if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. You can download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. Twins over under, I believe today is 84 and a half wins. If you like the over, go bet it. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel of the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every day. Lockdown MLB Prospects is outstanding with host Lindsey Crosby. He's a prospect encyclopedia going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. We're, going, we're back in, in September right now of 2022, and this is illustrating my point about 2023 and the depth. The rotation, the, the probables, Bundy, Archer, Winder versus Quantrill, McKenzie, Bieber. Here's the, the lineup in game one for the Twins. Luis Arise leading off, that was normal. Carlos Correa hitting second, that was normal. And then things get a little crazy. Jose Moreno's batting third. Nick Gordon was hitting cleanup. Gio Urshela hitting fifth. Gary Sanchez, six, DHing. Jake Cave, seven. Gilberto Celestino, eight. Sandy Leone, nine. Six of the nine in what I would describe as a must win series. Six of those nine twins are not projected to make the 26-man roster for one reason or another. The Twins traded a rise. They traded Urshela for a lottery ticket prospect. Gary Sanchez, Jake Cave, Hilberto Celestino likely to not make the opening day roster, and he was playing you know, center field for the Twins in their biggest series of the year. Sandy Leon was batting ninth and catching. They picked him up at the trade deadline off of Cleveland's AAA club in a trade. Like that illustrates to me where we're at here. They had no Buxton, which is not unusual. I, I acknowledge that. No Jeffers, no Kirilov, no Larnick, no Polanco, no Kepler. He did pinch hit that night, but he was struggling. He was banged up. Six of the nine, not projected to make the opening day roster for one reason or another. The three holdovers are two, three, four in Correa, Miranda, and Gordon. By definition, your best hitters in that lineup, along with Luis Suarez, who is leading off. But that's like, I, I can't believe that was the situation. Then in game two, it was an injured Chris Archer with his hip, hurt pitching against Tristan McKenzie, who was having a fabulous season. The Sunday game, it was a weekend now that I remember it. Josh Winder is starting the day game versus Shane Bieber. Rookie Josh Winder in what was an up and down year with shoulder problems and ineffectiveness, his fastball got destroyed. Pitching against Shane Bieber, you know, the Cy Young winner from 2020 in a, a Sunday game, 
and the Twins had lost the first two games in the series that they needed to win. That's where we're at. So how is it going to be different in 2023? Here's how. Here's the Twins leading innings accumulations from 2022 in order. Joe Ryan, Dylan Bundy, Sonny Gray, Chris Archer, Devin Smeltzer, Josh Winder, Bailey Ober, Cole Sands, and Aaron Sanchez. I know some of those innings for Sands came in relief, but stick with me here. So Joe Ryan led the team in innings. He remains on the staff for 2023. Dylan Bundy was second on the team in innings in 2022. You're hoping those are transition plus more to Pablo Lopez. Sonny Gray still on the team. He was third in innings. Chris Archer, you're hoping those innings are given to Tyler Malley. Devin Smeltzer, you're hoping those innings are given to Bailey Ober plus more. Josh Winder, hoping those innings are given to Louis Varlin. Bailey Ober from 2022, now you move down the depth chart. You're hope, hoping his innings, you hope Winder's healthy, but are given to Josh Winder. So if you're following, everybody's getting pushed down. And because there were additions and Pablo Lopez was added, you're hoping Tyler Malley is healthy. I mean, some of this is just you need health. But on paper, everybody's pushed down. You know, Cole Sands turns into Simeon Woods Richardson, who's a former top 100 prospect, was fabulous at AAA and in the upper minors last year. Aaron Sanchez becomes Kenta Maeda, you know, and more. That That's what I'm saying here. Not only are you hoping these transfer, you know, Bundy replaced by Lopez, Archer replaced by Malley, but you're hoping for more innings and most importantly, more quality innings. And you can, I think, reasonably expect it for 2023. If I'm going to look at this roster. I'm going to look at this pitching staff. I'm going to objectively say so much deeper than 2022, so much deeper where if you lose a couple starters, I don't think they're going to be in a situation where you're starting, a, you know, three pitchers in a must win series in September. You would hope not to start in those games. You would hope that doesn't have to happen. And I could be dead wrong. We could get to September and the twins are just ravaged by injuries. But on the pitching side last year, like, yes, they got hurt. Chris Paddock was hurt. Winder Balzavik had a rough year in the minors that impacted everything. Sonny Gray had hamstring injuries. Tyler Malley came over at the deadline. He got hurt. Definitely impacted things. But this rotation is so much better built to withstand an equal amount of injuries on the pitching side in 2023. It's not going to be pretty if they have the same amount of injuries, but it's going to be much better, I think, than it was in 2022 from a sheer depth standpoint on the starting pitching side. That's why I think the floor will be higher up to 75 wins rather than 70 from 2022. And those additional wins, those additional wins, because I think you can reasonably set a floor at 77 to 80 wins for the Twins, especially in the American League Central. I know less games in the Central, but I'm setting a high floor while accounting for the ceiling. I'm setting a high floor because of the position player side as well. I'm going to tell you how the Twins are much better on that side of the ball after this word from Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, you got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays now into late January, and I know you got to keep that New Year's resolution for me. Eat healthier, stay healthier. Built Bars, great way to do that. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. What makes Built Bars so good? They're covered in that chocolate, but they're also healthy. They come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better is that they're healthy, only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your built bars at built.com, which you still can do, but now you can get them at a local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of built bars. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13 bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. Also at Walmart, built bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. So the twins, I think. Flores raised in the rotation, uh, furthered by the trade for Pablo Lopez. I probably would have said this a similar thing, even if they didn't trade for Lopez, because hypothetically Maeda and Mali are back, Bailey Ober back, all injury question marks, of course. But you added Lopez, that raises the floor even more in the starting in the starting rotation on paper. On the lineup side, Gary Sanchez and Sandy Leon. That catching duo at, in September, you're hoping in September of 2023, it's Ryan Jeffers and Christian Vasquez, which is 
loads better. The bench in September, you know, the bench, and sometimes that's a fluid word because there's platoons on the bench. Like, are they really bench players if they're starting four out of six games, you know, against right handed pitching? But the bench goes from Gilberto Celestino, Jake Cave, Sandy Leone, and Gary Sanchez, you know, you were hoping was a bench player, but he became the primary catcher with Sandy Leone. You were hoping Gary was in a timeshare, yes, with Ryan Jeffers, but more on the short side of that. That bench turns into Michael A. Taylor, who's an elite defensive center fielder and a borderline starter, you know, started for a a poor Kansas City team, but a borderline starter, high-end backup, Kyle Farmer, same boat as Michael A. Taylor. Trevor Larnick, I currently project to be on the bench because it's Kepler, Buxton, and Gallo across the outfield. And Ryan Jeffers on the bench as your backup catcher with Christian Vasquez starting a majority of games behind the dish. Defensively, the Twins should be better with Gallo and right. You're moving Kepler to left right now. We'll see if Kepler moves. You know, Buxton's out there in center on paper. You have Correa at short. You got Vasquez catching the defense Luis Arise is no longer at first base you're hoping Alex Kirloff takes a, a large chunk at first base as a as a potential gold glove caliber first baseman I think that's the hope for Alex Kirloff but if nothing else bigger you know better target than Luis Arise was I know Luis Arise was a gold glove finalist but I'll take Alex Kirloff's future defensive outlook at first base over Louis all the love to Louis I'll take AK uh defensively at first so they should be better defensively which is floor like I think of that as floor defensively less gas they weren't bad defensively last year the infield graded out poorly Jose Moran has taken over at third we don't know at the at the major league level how he's gonna be but Gio Rochella for as great as he looked didn't grade out very well and Carlos Correa had a down defensive season by his standards Jorge Polanco missed basically all of September and then I mentioned Luis Arise and Alex Kirloff kind of swapping there at first base with Louie going to Miami. So better defensively. Gal is one of the best defensive corner outfielders in baseball who can swing over, play center. You have Byron Buxton. You have Max Kepler. Michael A. Taylor on the bench is a premium center fielder. Defensively, most defensive run save in the outfield since 2020 of all outfielders in baseball. Defensively, the floor is raised. Offensively, that's the biggest one. Losing Luis Arise definitely lowers the floor. I think adding Lopez kind of negates that on some level because you're adding depth. And we we went over that last week. Like, are they better? Are they worse? Are they the same? Kind of came to the conclusion they're probably about the same from a wins above replacement standpoint. So the depth you're losing in a rise on the position player side, you're gaining with Lopez on the pitching side. You wonder about the lineup. You know, you wonder about the injuries in the lineup as well. It's not like the twins are going in with this dynamo group into spring training of everybody's coming in healthy. Everybody's going to stay healthy. There's going to be problems, but I think the twins are much better suited to handle those problems, to handle the war of attrition. That is the American league central through 162 games. And nobody wants to hear it anymore. You know, nobody wants to hear that the twins were in first place for over a hundred days in 2022, that somehow they stayed there even with ineffectiveness, a shallow rotation that wasn't properly addressed fully last off season. And I'm, I've said that injuries, pitching side injuries on the position player side, especially on the bench in the minors, they somehow stuck around into September and were a game and a half back with 26 to play. Things are going to play out differently. The schedule is different. You know, they're going to play a different schedule. Cleveland will as well. The White Sox season will will likely play out differently. Every new year is different, but this division has shown over and over there. If you can stay healthy and you have enough talent and you have enough depth, you will have an opportunity to win the American League Central in September. You will have that chance. If you don't, someone else is going to win it. And I, I get annoyed when people constantly say like the American League Central is terrible. It's the worst division in baseball. It probably is. You know, the NL Central is not great either. The American League Central, not not a good division. It's not a, a particularly top-heavy division, but you're probably looking at higher floors this year from those top three teams. Twins, Guardians, White Sox. I think they're all going to win at least 76 to 78 games because of the rest of the division. And I don't think any of the three teams are particularly elite where they're going to beat up on the other two. So I think... It's, it's going to be 
a similar storyline to last year for the Twins where they're going to be in it. I think they're going to be in it because the Central gifts you that opportunity regularly. There's a chance Cleveland just has, you know, a 2016 type of season where they're just incredible. Their young players come. The guys from last year, Stephen Kwan, Andres Jimenez, Oscar Gonzalez, take another step forward. Their rotation is always good. That's a possibility. It's a possibility the White Sox just click. They click this year. Dylan Cease wins the Cy Young. Lucas Giolito bounces back. He's a clear number two, but also a frontline starter. You know, Lance Lynn has a healthy season. Michael Kopech is outstanding. Eloy Jimenez hits 40 home runs. That's possible, too. You know what else is possible is the Twins stay relatively healthy. Alex Kirloff breaks out. Pablo Lopez, Sonny Gray, Tyler Malley, Joe Ryan is a deep, good, strong rotation. Carlos Cray and Byron Buxton back-to-back in the lineup are awesome together. You get some breakouts on the offensive side. Jose Miranda hits 30 home runs, and the Twins have a great year. Like Those things are all possible to me in this season which makes baseball so fun like makes it so fun to analyze because i just want to see how it goes i'm just so curious to see how this goes but i will say this with certainty the twins are much better suited to withstand injuries in 2023 i'm confident in saying that did they take away from their ceiling i mean i don't that logic doesn't really remain sound with me because the team they didn't lose anybody who had a bunch of upside other than Luis Arise who was a four-win player last year was so that's something they gained Pablo Lopez who I view as having upside at, at 26 years old I don't know if they lost a bunch of upside from last year but I definitely think they gained in floor so today I would say the twins will at, win at least 78 games I'm confident they won 78 last year I don't think they're gonna win less and maybe that's I'm not saying that you know, in like a super I'm excited way, but I just don't see, and this wasn't the case last year. I don't see a scenario where the twins go out there and just are terrible. Like, I just don't see it. I I don't see it in this division. I don't see it on the roster. I don't see it in the minors with depth they have coming. This is all hopeful and, and hypothetical. I don't see that this year. I saw it last year. I saw a preseason, hey, this this team could win 70, this team could win 90. I can see both outcomes because of how much they were to rely on young pitching. It didn't work out. It didn't completely blow. It was a poor division. Cleveland ran away at the end, and the Twins won 78 games. This year, I'm confident in saying they will – at, they will win at least 78 games. At least that will be the, the least amount of games they win because I think the roster is much better suited to withstand injury. It's much deeper on paper, and this division is still not scary to me. Even though I think Cleveland's a good team, I think the Guardians have a good team. I think the White Sox are a little bit dangerous. You know, it's a team you have to watch because of the talent they have and guys who have down years who have been good in, in prior years and have helped them win. Have to keep an eye on the Sox. Even Detroit and Kansas City, it's hard to get much worse. So I I don't think that the division is going to be awful. I don't think the division will be good. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a division that has a 95-game winner. It's possible it does. But for all those reasons, I think the Twins' floor is much higher. And how do you you have a good team? Or how do you have a winning team? you got to start with a good floor. You have to start with a, a good, strong, high floor. And that will keep fans engaged. That will keep everybody, their attention, wondering what's going to happen. How is this going to play out? They had my attention in September. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. It didn't play out uh, particularly pretty. But they were a game and a half back with 26 to play. And they trotted out Bundy, Archer, and Winder in a uh, home series against Cleveland and and Cal Quantrill, Tristan McKenzie, and Shane Bieber. So that's... I kind of hang my hat on that. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't, but I think they've made moves this offseason to target that. They've added depth in the rotation. They've added depth on the bench with Michael A. Taylor and Kyle Farmer. They've added depth up the middle with Christian Vasquez. They've added a right fielder in Joey Gallo who can also swing over and back up Byron and center with Michael A. Taylor. Kepler's still on the roster. They have a lot of depth here. They got a lot of depth, and some of it's very redundant. I'm not sure they really care. I think they want to be sure as sure as they can be going into the season that we're going to have backup plans on backup plans on backup plans. We're going to try to prevent what happened in 2022 from happening in 2023. I'm on board with that. I'm on board with trying that. I don't think it's flawless. I think you can end up giving guys at bats who shouldn't be getting at bats. I think you could run into a roster crunch situation. I'll take that over Dylan Bundy, Chris Archer, Josh Weiner starting 
a must win series at home in the division in September. I'll take I'll take the roster crunch over that. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every single day on the Lockdown Podcast Network where it's your team every single day. Now make your second listen. Lockdown MLB Prospects host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Dick Bramer coming on scheduled for Tuesday. Join me then. Thanks so much. Have a great day and go Twins.